Well, we're doing something a little bit different today. We're going to talk about giving and taking. And really, there's two types of people in the world. There are givers and there are takers. And there's a great book written by Adam Grant. It's called Givers and Takers. I highly recommend it. He, he's a clinical psychologist, and he did a lot of research on this. And he says there's two types. Of, he says there's three types of people. He says givers, takers, and matchers. In other words, some people are just takers. Some people are givers. And some people are matchers. In other words, I'll do it if you do this. He says the majority of the people are that way. I like to look at myself a giver. But sometimes when I go to Costco, I can be a little bit of a taker. Can I, can I share a little story with you at Costco? Okay. How many like go to Costco, right? Yeah, okay. And I like the samples. You got to go earlier in the day. You can't go at night. So one day I went to Costco. It was amazing. They had Philly cheesesteak samples. They had, they had, they had meatballs. They had shrimp cocktails. So what I was doing is I would watch the lady. It was my wife was shopping. I'd watch the lady, and no one's there. And as soon as she put it on the table, I immediately bolted for it. And there was this little kid in my way. I pushed him away, and I got the shrimp cocktail. <laughs> then I moved away, and I walked around, and I began to hover like a vulture looking for, the, looking for another tray to come out, and I grabbed another one. While that was happening, the Philly Chakes Steaks, uh, cheese steaks were coming out. So I went over there. And then I saw another little kid and a mother, and she had a little child, and I pushed them aside, and I grabbed that. And so the manager came up to me and said, what's your problem, sir? Sir, sir, listen, I paid $65 to be a member in this place. I want to get my member's worth. I think I have every right in the world to do that. He kicked me out of the store. I'm not allowed to go to Costco anymore. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. How many actually believe that story? Oh, my gosh, a couple of you. The last service, about 15 people thought it was true. But how many of you done this before? You're in college, and you're trying to get to your class, and you're circling the parking lot looking for that space. Or it's Christmas Eve, and there's a parking space. And how many folks know you're sitting there, you see that place, what do you do? You stop, and you go ahead and say, go ahead, take the spot. I'll walk 1,500 feet in the rain in the sleet. How many of you do that, right? No. We often grab that spot, don't we? And so often we're givers and takers. And Adam Grant talks about that. He talks about how in the book, I'm not going to preach about Adam Grant, but I'm just giving you a little introduction on it because what he researches backs up what the Bible says, of course. And this is what he said through a lot of research that often people that are, 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 are takers, they want money, they want material possessions, they want power, they want pleasure, they want to win and do better than everyone else. They want to win in everything, including Monopoly. They want to win in everything. And they want dominance, they want control. And we look at people like self-made man or woman, and we think, wow, look at that person. Or other people are givers, and they're, they're helpful. They, they want the well-being of others. They want to be responsible and dependable. They believe in social justice, not in a political correct way, but literally care about those that are suffering, and they have compassion. It was so amazing that they did a research study on a number of a, a countries around the world, and here are the countries that they did a study on. It was Australia, Chile, Finland, France, Germany, Israel, Malaysia, the Netherlands, South Africa, Spain, Sweden, the United States. No Brazil, I'm sorry. Or Colombia. And they found out in this survey, guess what countries thought it was best to be a giver than a taker? Go ahead. All of them. Unanimously, every single nation that did a scientific study said, we admire people that are givers and not takers. Why is that? It's the case because God is a giver. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He came looking for us. For God so loved the world, he what? He gave. So God's nature is giving. Everything God does is giving. So because we're made in God's image, there is something inside of us that knows that's right. And we really admire people, although we celebrate people who are bullish and all that. But inside, we like it. Why? Because we're made in the image of God. In fact, the more you give the more you receive, and the Bible talks about that. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to be a giver and a taker? Well, let me just stop you for a second and just kind of help you understand a little bit about God. You see, the Bible says, this is one of the revelations I've been really focusing on recently is this. The Bible says, in the beginning, there was God. Before he made the heavens and the universe, there was God. 
There was God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, let us make men in our own image. Right there in Genesis chapter 1. Now, before there was anything else, you had the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All working together. The Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And they kept bouncing off that love. One would give, one would receive. One would give, receive. And what happened is it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And God's love was so amazing that out of that love, he created the universe. So the most powerful power force in the universe is not any nuclear infusion, not a black hole, not a supernova. It is the love of God because the love of God came before everything else and that love of God is a God that gives and receives. And I want to encourage you today is God does not want you to be a giver, a taker, or a matcher. He wants you to be a giver and receiver. And we're going to describe what that looks like. It controls almost every area of our lives. In fact, 20 centuries, 20 centuries later, we're talking about this, but before that, Jesus was dealing with his disciples. We're reading from Mark chapter 10. You can follow with this online or your Bible or your pad or whatever you want to use. And here's a story which illustrates about giving and taking. In Mark chapter 10, and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, these guys were called the sons of thunder. I kind of like these guys. They were moving up. Remember, everybody, Jesus was beginning his ministry and they were rising in popularity. They were like on the basement, ground floor of this upstart called Christianity, which they didn't know yet. And they were excited about being with Jesus. They saw he was a winner, and they, had, they were really excited about that. They threw their lot in with Jesus. So James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now let's stop there for a moment. Do we not all want the same? God, I want you to do what I want me. God, I want you to do what I want, right? We often sell Christianity that way. Give your life to Jesus, and everything is going to be better. You'll be happier. You'll be prettier. You'll be richer, right? It's all about health, wealth, and healing at all times. You give your life to Jesus, it's all going to be better. And we often sell, not we, other churches, of course, not Cornerstone, but I'm just kidding. But we often sell it that way. Give your life to Jesus. It will all get better. And then it becomes like a lotto. It's like if you will hit the slot machine one of these days, you're going to cash in. But keep on praying. Keep on giving to the church. Come on. Give $100. God will give you 1000 back. And we sell it like God is here to make your dreams come true. Ooh, 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 ooh. We want God to make our dreams come true. Now, listen. Now am I not done here? Listen to this. We want you to do whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? Whoa. He didn't say, what's wrong with you guys? He said, what do you want me to do? They're thinking, this is fantastic. We're cashing in. We got the lotto numbers. We're going to get it. And they said to him, grant us to sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. In other words, we want to be in your cabinet. Now, we're not talking about politics, but we want to be in your cabinet. We want to be in the echelons of power, God. We want to forget about those other 10. We are the cream of the crop. This is what we want. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, grant us to sit at one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Let me just stop there for a moment. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. You know, I thank God every day, nearly, that God did not give me what I've asked for. Because I had no idea what I was talking about or doing. A number of years ago, there was another young lady that I was in love with, I was engaged to, and I thought she was it. And I thank God. My dad and I were having this discussion the other day. Thank God you didn't marry that woman. And by the way, she's a nice woman. God bless her. We want the best for her. But my dad... <laughs> My dad said, thank God I'd have to go to the Midwest to see you all the time. But anyhow, but I, I thank God I did not marry. At the time, it was like, God, give her back. And I thank God because I did an amazing thing. I don't know how I did it, but I happened to manage to find Sandra, the most amazing woman I could ever ask for in my life, my wife, Sandra. And I'm not saying that because I want points, but I do. That's part of it. But all kidding aside... I did not know what was best for me at that time. And so if I got what I asked for, I would not be here today. 
My children would not be here today. And frankly, I don't know if I'd be in the ministry today. I don't know what I'd be doing. Probably at 7-Eleven working someplace. I don't know. But it was not God. Nothing wrong with 7-Eleven, by the way, okay? But I, who knows where I would have been if I did not get to meet Sandra and my prayers were not answered. Sometimes we don't know what we're asking. And these guys had no clue what they were asking. Verse 38, Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism which I would be baptized? And they said, we're able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And then with the baptism in which I'm baptized, you will be baptized. They had no idea what he's talking about. But to sit at my right hand, at my left, is not mine to grant. But it's for those whom it's been prepared. And when they heard it, they, the disciples, began to be indignant at James and John. Now, I know the word indignant is a word you use all the time. I encourage you to employ that word this coming week as you meet with people around the Thanksgiving table. If you find someone frustrating, instead of using any other kind of language, just say, I'm indignant with you. And they don't know what you're talking about, and it will make you look good and smart, and then you'll be able to tell them you're angry without being mean. So look at your neighbor and say, I'm not indignant. In the Greek, they were hacked off. They were ex- very angry. It's like someone that you are working hard on a project at work. You're doing a sales presentation. The CEO comes in, and he says, Out of great job, guys. And these two guys stand up and take the credit, and you've been doing the same amount of work, if not more. It's like that person that gets the job promotion. It's that person that gets gets the new job or whatever you want to get. They were very upset. Why? And then Jesus called them to him and said to them, You do not know, do you not know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them? He goes on to say, But it shall not be among you, but whoever would be great among you must be what? The servant. And you know what the servant means, by the way? In the Greek, it means doulos, not do less. That would be kind of fun. No, doulos means slave that has chosen to serve the master and that's not interested in its own affairs. You know, when I went to Malaysia with my son Luke to uh, see Raymond, he'll be here in January. They had a school there. There was a guy named John there that was with Pastor Raymond for 30 years. And this guy's whole job, he says, I count it a privilege and honor to stand alongside my pastor and serve him. That's all he wanted to do was to serve his pastor. I was really admired by that. I went to another time. I went to Indonesia one time. And uh, we were unloading bags. And a really very powerful pastor was there. And some of the servants were grabbing the bags. And I wanted to help the servants. And I grabbed the bag. And as soon as I did that, and the, the pastor saw that I was doing that and not the servant, he ripped in to the guy. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know what he was saying, but it wasn't good. Probably called him indignant, all right? I'm indignant. And so and I'm like, whoa. And I was at 23 years old at the time. I'm not going to correct the pastor who's about 55 or 60. But I was amazed that they looked down on this guy and treated him so poorly. I was just trying to be, you, know, you follow what I'm saying? So whoever be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came not to be served, but what? To serve. To what? Give. Not to take. And to give his life a ransom from many. What does a taker look like? Well, we looked at it already, right? Lord, we want you to do whatever we ask. And and it's called the American dream. I want to be happy. I serve the God of happiness. As long as God provides for me, he's my God. The moment he does not do what I ask him to do or disappoints me, I'm going to deconstruct my faith. There's a lot of people deconstructing their faith because they bought a lie thinking that God was there to serve them. God's not here to serve you. God has served you so you can serve him, so you can be fully who he created you to be because he made you, he loves you, he knows what's best for you, he knows every cell, he knows everything about you, and he loves you so much, but it never works until you and I give up trying to take from him. Instead, we want to receive from God and give back to him worship. And so this is all part of it. So this is what happens. What does takers look like? Takers are people who focus upon titles and roles. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when people demand titles, usually they are entitled. There's nothing wrong with having ranks. There's nothing wrong with having a corporate structure. There's nothing wrong with having different, uh, different stratas of responsibility. That is fine. It's nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, what's in your heart? Do you think you're better than somebody else because you make more money? Or do you think someone's worse than you because they make more money or less money? We begin to put people on different strata, and we evaluate ourselves by other standards. You see, people that focus on jobs and titles. Well, I've been going to Cornerstone for five years. And all of a sudden, we got this new guy who plays the drums. I don't know who he is. I should be playing drums, and they didn't let me play drums. They're not, they're not honoring my anointing. Well, your anointing is annoying <laughs> because you keep demanding that we do things for you. If you really want to play drums and honor God, why don't you go play some drums in the kids' church? Well, God has given me a great voice. I'm a worship leader. It's been prophesied to me that I'm a worship leader, and they're not putting on the team. They're hindering God's work in my life. Okay, great. You want to bless God? Why don't you go to the nursing home with the benevolence team and go sing there for the older people? Why? Are you too important for them? You see about this title thing? It can happen all the time. And, and matter of fact, there was a time where, you know, I'm kind of old-fashioned, where I grew up, Mr., Mrs., right? For example, we have Pastor Tom Buckin, and uh, I cannot call him Tom. Oh, it bothers me. I can't call him that. I say Pastor Tom. In fact, uh, the founder of our church, Pastor Howard Ranker, I can't call him, I can't do it. It's Pastor Howard. In fact, can we pray for Pastor Howard right now? I don't know if you're aware, he's the founder of our church, 1982. Him and his wife began this church. His son, Jonathan, passed away this past week, a couple days ago. He had a long battle with brain tumors, and he went home to be with the Lord. And so I just want to take a moment to pray for Pastor Howard and his family. Can we go ahead and do that, everybody? Father, we just thank you so much for Pastor Howard. We thank you for Jonathan, that he was a believer in you. We thank you for the promise in Scripture that to be absent from the body is to be present with you. Lord, we thank you that Jonathan is released of his suffering. But Lord, we are praying for grace to be upon his daughters, upon Pastor Howard, upon the entire family. Lord, we ask out of this loss that people would dedicate their lives to you. They would take stock of their lives, recognizing how short life is and how important you are. Lord, bless the entire Ranker, Ranker family, and all those associated with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Be watching for that. We'll be talking about that on our social media when we're going to have a memorial service. He asked me, I said, of course. And so, not an easy thing. But people who want titles and roles. In fact, there was a time where I stopped saying, Pastor Eric Bucci, you know, like all this other stuff. And so I started saying, I started saying this. My name is Eric, and I'm the pastor of the church. Someone made an appointment with me to talk to me about that. Pastor, I'm a little upset with you. Why? Because you're calling yourself Eric and I'm the pastor of the church. That's disrespectful. It should be Pastor Eric Bucci. And I realized the reason they said that for, because they wanted a title. And if I don't have a title, they can't get one. Ouch. 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 That's an Italian way of saying ouch. Because <laughs> my last name is Bucci. Okay. Takers are people who focus on titles. Takers are people who focus on self-promotion. I want to be the front. I want to be the best. Jesus said the following. He said, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. You see, this is what happens. They want benefactors. This is the world's way. This is the taker's way. I'm the leader. You need to follow me, and you need to bless me. There's nothing wrong with honoring leadership. In fact, that's godly. The Bible says, pray, submit to your leaders. There's nothing wrong with that. But when the leader thinks that the leader is better or greater or has more intrinsic value than somebody else, that's a problem. You see? And that's a taker's way. Jesus inverted it. He said, whoever wants to be the greatest will first be the servant. And so leaders are supposed to serve the people. Our job is not to empower ourselves. Our job is to empower each other. Now, let me just tell you something. This is a good test. How do you know if you're a giver or taker? Well, we're coming up to Christmas parties. Don't you love Christmas parties? And different things like that. How about when you go on a party? What do you think when you meet somebody? Gee, I hope I look good. I hope they like me. You meet somebody, you're talking to them, and you're finding out what they do for work. 
What do they do for work? How much money do they make? I wonder how I compare to them. What are you thinking about at that moment when you're trying to talk to that person? What are you thinking about? You're being a what? Taker. What does, what happens when you're a taker? You get anxious. Am I good enough? Are they going to like me? I hope I'm okay. Uh, gee, or how about this? Who's this person? <laughs> Can't waste my time with these losers. Oof. Start thinking that way, you get an arrogant head, right? And what the problem is, whether you're insecure or you think you're better than somebody else, guess what you're thinking about? You're thinking about yourself. You are taking. You're taking your reputation and knocking yourself down or picking yourself up as greater or equal to this person. And so it's all about you. I heard about of a woman who is very much a narcissistic person, and she said, enough about talking about me. She said, what do you think of me? And there are people like that. And listen, everybody, if you start feeling, if you start feeling insecure at a party or a social event, ask yourself the question, why do I feel insecure? Well, I don't know if, they, if I measure up. You have a taker's mentality. Now, what you should do is be a giver mentality. How can I lead this conversation better? How can I bless somebody? How can I encourage somebody? Gee, this person is a nice person. Let me find something irredeemable to say about them. Let me help them. You know what happens when you do that? Anxiety goes away. Depression goes away. Intimidation goes away. Lord, let me be a blessing to these people. What would happen if you're not going to feel that way anymore? In fact, uh, Kevin, uh, Kevin Mann and I, we were, went to New York City for a, a banquet, and there was this man we were talking to, nice guy, and we started talking, and I'm like, okay, this guy's all right. I started talking to him, and this is nice. We started sharing, what's, what, what are you from? Oh, oh, he said, oh, I'm from Oklahoma. I said, oh, Oklahoma, that's a great place. And, and I get to sit down, and all of a sudden, they, the guy gets up. His name is Green, the CEO of, of Hobby Lobby, a multi-billionaire, multi-multi-billionaire. And I had no idea who he was. He spoke to me as if I was the most important person in the room. I had no idea who he was. If I knew who he was, I'd probably stumble with myself a little bit because he's a man there. Right? Why? Because I'm a taker mentality. What happens when you're a giver mentality? God, how can I be a blessing to this person? I'm telling you, most of our problems happen. A lot of people are on medication for anxiety and depression because they just are takers. It's not fair. They should do this for me. I want this. I want the other. Jimmy, Jimmy is my name. Give me, give me. It's all about what I can get out of somebody. I'm insecure based upon that person. It creates so much difficulty. Listen, God's way is so much better. Let me leave the room better than I found it by blessing someone. I don't care what people think about me. I want to be a blessing to them. Now, how much better is that, everybody? Easier said than done, right? Most of us are matchers. <laughs> Who's that person think they are? I'll knock them down. Guess what that is? If you're a matcher, you're still a taker. Why? Because you're calling the shots. Father, I want to be a giver, not a taker. You see, the Bible says this, freely you have received. Now, freely give. See, there's a great man. You might have, you might have not heard of him. There's a man that was a couple decades ago he grew up in the Midwest, in Missouri, and uh, a very poor person. In fact, they had no plumbing in their house. He uh, saved enough money to work on farms, put himself through college at the University of Missouri, and earned his, his, his degree, uh, Beta Kappa. He got a high degree, did very well, completed his master's degree, and then he went to a doctorate in economics. Very bright guy. His family was so proud of him. He served several important roles in government, uh, he also got the Naval Accommodation Medal and a National Defense Service Medal. This guy was amazing and was the CEO of a company for 15 years and brought the value up to $110 billion over 20 years ago. Adjust that for entrance, interest, it's probably like $200 billion. This guy was amazing. And by the time he stepped down, the man's company was worth all this. He had 20,000 employees in over 40 countries. And Fortune magazine, for five years in a row, called it the best place to work. His employees were so satisfied and so happy. They say it was America's most innovative company, one of the best places to work in America. And when asked about his success, look what he had to say. He said, it's all about the golden rule. So he said, it's all about the golden rule. Only problem was, the man was indicted. 
The man was not a giver. He was a faker. This man was evil. This man had 20,000 people lost their jobs. Over $70 billion was lost. This man inflated his worth, and they were deceptive. He ended up dying before he went to trial in, in Colorado. This, and it was found this guy was a crook. He was a faker. And everyone thought he was amazing. You see, God judges by the heart. Whatever you do, you're going to be found out eventually. Isn't that sad? You know what's so amazing about this? They've done studies, and there was a book, and in this book, uh, by the way, um, I'm referencing it a couple times because some great illustrations talked about in this book. They began to study different CEOs, and they're trying to figure out uh, which CEOs are takers and which are givers. And their criteria was not the uh, bottom line, how much money they brought in for the shareholders. They looked at these annual reports, and this is what they noticed. The people that had the biggest picture of themselves were the takers. The CEOs, where you couldn't really find who they were, they always talked about their employees and how great they helped the company. Those were the ones that were the givers. The ones that were about self-promotion. And you know what this gentleman had? He had a two-page spread about himself. Now, pastors don't do that. I was going to go backstage with the bench press and do about 22 sets and do some curls and oil myself up and come out. <laughs> Welcome to Cornerstone Church. <laughs> right? Try to impress you, but I, I'm very modest and I do this on purpose to make sure. That's why we're black, to make sure. No, all kidding aside, there are people that do that. There are pastors that do that and there are business people that do that. And, and there are others, the other people, which act like, oh, I'm so humble, but they're not humble at all. In different cultures of the world, they celebrate humility and they use humility as pride. So it's like the little boy who won the prize for being humble but lost it by wearing it. It just doesn't work. You see, what is a giver? Givers are people who are willing to be servants. Willing to be servants. Givers are people who are willing to sacrifice. Although I may not get the promotion, I want to do what's best for the company. What? Listen, we're not talking about we're going to be a bunch of passive men. Okay, it's all right. Take my job. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. No, no, do it. no. we're not talking about that. We're talking about being bold in the Lord and the power's might. I will boast in the Lord my God. I'm going to boast in what he's doing. I want to reach more people for Jesus. I want to help people come to know Christ. And that's not just being vain. That's trying to reach more people for Jesus. And I pray that's our purpose here at Cornerstone Church, to make more of an impact, not to be a big church. Right? It's not about that. In fact, if someone keeps on saying, it's not about me, it's not about me, it's not about me, the fact that they're saying that it's probably about them. If you're not aware of it. You see, givers are people who are willing to sacrifice. The Bible says, for the, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Can I give you a, a little story about myself? A number of years ago, probably 20, actually 25 years ago or so, um, prior to that, I was in, in graduate school. I started playing guitar. I grew up in the 1980s where we had singers like Steve Perry and Michael Bolton. These guys could sing, so I, I can't sing. So I just started playing guitar, and I'd do a, a Bible study or something. Hey, man, pa pastor, you're pretty good at I mean, that wasn't a pastor. Eric, you're pretty good at leading worship. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much. Someone prophesied, God's going to use you to sing to thousands. The world's going to sing your songs and, you know, all this kind of nonsense. And some of it was true, some of it wasn't true. And so and then, I, then later on what happened was I was at a church and the uh, worship guy stepped down for a variety of reasons and I was in charge. And I was I'm like, praise God, this is amazing. And I led this very next week, the man left. And I had everyone coming up to me, attaboy, Eric, you did a great job. You're much more anointed than the last guy. I'm like, well, thank you very much. It's not me, it's the Lord. It's not me, it's the Lord. It's not me, it's the Lord. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. It's not me, it's the Lord. And so this goes on for about a month or so, but there was a problem. There was another man in the church who was also there a long time, had leadership. Of course, he wasn't as good as I was. Just kidding. But the pastor realized that it was not a good thing for me because he saw the turmoil that was causing him with this other guy. So the pastor said, I want you to, to step down. I want him, this other guy, to step up. He will be the worship leader. You support him. I'm like, oh, pastor, I'd be happy to help any way I can. A night 
I don't know if it was a night after or, 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 or a couple nights after, all of a sudden it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and I woke up in a cold sweat with anxiety. It's like, I almost felt like the Gestapo was outside to arrest me. I mean, I, I just woke up, my heart was beating, I was sweating. I was like, honey, what's going on with me? I'm being attacked by the devil. You know, <laughs> so my wife, Sandra, you know, starts praying for me. And I'm like, well, honey, what's going on? She asked me, what are you thinking? I don't know. I keep thinking about the worship team. What's going on? The worship team's being attacked. And then I realized, wait a minute here. Wait a minute. We began to question. Wait a minute. Hold it. Oh, my God. My identity is wrapped up in me leading worship. And I'm jealous and insecure that this guy is getting my title. I'm entitled and I'm upset about it. Oh, wow, what a revelation. So I got to the side of the bed, and I said, God, forgive me for being that way. Sandra and I prayed. I have a godly wife. Can I just say thank you, Lord? I mean that. She could have said, how dare they do that? You're a man of God. You're so much more anointed than he is. She didn't do that. <laughs> She's not that way, okay? She's not that way. Okay, but you've been in churches like that, right? We love those churches. Okay, so anyhow, so, so what happened was I had to repent of that. And you know what happened? Anxiety left, and I was completely free. Oh, what a, what a relief. Do you see the turmoil that was? Did I love Jesus? Absolutely. Did I worship with a sincere heart? Yes, but a lot of it was about my own ego because I want to be validated. A lot of us, all of our lives, we want to be validated by people and circumstances. Maybe your dad told you you never amount to anything. Maybe your mother told you that. Maybe you're divorced and you don't think you're good enough anymore. You're scum of the earth and you're trying to get value. So you're trying to do everything for people to like you. You try to look good on Instagram. You do everything you can. You don't go outside the door unless you spend two and a half hours with Aquanet. Is that still around? But you're trying to look good. I'm dating myself. Uh, my Michael Bolton and Steve Perry. But anyhow, uh, so you're, you're, it's all about how you look. You want to take the best picture of yourself on Instagram. You spend six hours like this trying to get the right photograph. And then you see, I see this person. Who is this person on Facebook? Oh, that's you. I don't say anything. Anyhow. But we spend all this time trying to impress people. And then you're jealous that someone gets something you don't get. Guys, that causes so much stress, so much anxiety. God's ways are so much better, right? Amen. So this is what we want to be able to do. You see, givers are people who are willing to be servants. Givers are people who are willing to sacrifice. Givers are people who have the greatest impact. You see, there are basically three types of people, and I want to encourage you, and I'm going to tell you this morning which one you need to be according to the Bible. There are givers and takers. There are givers and matchers. Matchers still call the shots. And there are givers and receivers. You and I are not about giving and taking. You and I should be about giving and receiving. What does it mean to receive? Take mine, mine. The more you grab, the less satisfied you are. If Sandra and I, we were married, and imagine, if you will, if I'm trying to make sure, honey, am I, am I good enough? Am I good enough? I'm always trying to find my self-security, my security and my value based on Sandra. Sandra, oh, what, you still love me, honey? You still love me? Yes, I love you. And she calls me, honey, do you still love me? Oh, I still love you. And all day long, we're sappy, disgusting people, a bunch of leeches leeching on each other, trying to suck the life out of each other, saying, oh, am I worthy? Am I worthy? Oh, you see, am I worthy? Are you worthy? Are you worthy? Am I pretty? Am I strong? Am I a good pastor? Honey, tell me, am I good? And all day long, we're going back and forth. You know what happened a couple days ago? Sandra and I had a discussion. A nice discussion. You know what she said to me? She says, I don't get my value from you. I get my value from God. So what you said was rude, but I'm fine. Oh, boom. Can you say godly? Amen. You see, it's not about that. Some of you are waiting for your spouse or your louse or, or whatever you're trying to get that person to make you feel good. And if you're single thinking you're going to marry, don't make it that place. God is the only one. So what we want to do is give and receive. A gentleman told me this a number of years ago. He says the following. He said, tell me the following. He says, there's two people you can't outgive. You can't outgive God and you can't outgive your wife. Now, I, I'm not trying to get points, though I am. I'm not trying to get points. But honestly, honey, I've tried to outgive you and I can't. I just can't. However good I treat her, she treats me better. I kid you not. I can't outgive this woman. And I can't outgive God. 
And so what I want to do is when I give God something, I give to God, he gives back to me. And guess what I do? I don't take it. I receive it with thanksgiving. I receive it with thanksgiving. You see, the Bible talks about this, but as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. So what we want to do is receive the blessing of God. Are you following me, everybody? We want to receive the blessing of God. I want to receive with thanksgiving. So when you receive, and, and listen, the Apostle Paul says, I've learned a secret of content. Though I am not, I don't have everything I want to, but I thank God for what I have. I may not be the man I want to be, but I thank God for what I have. That's what we need to be like. There's thanksgiving. And thanksgiving is one of the greatest things that you and I can do. Why is that? Thanksgiving invites God's presence and his power. In the book of Rome, and actually, the Bible says here, be anxious for nothing, but when everything by what? And what? Thanksgiving. Given all circumstances, give what? Thanks. God wants you to give thanks in all circumstances. What's that supposed to mean? Praise God, I got in a car accident. Praise God, someone, my, this person has cancer. Am I supposed to praise God? No, God, I'm very upset. I make my supplication no, right? What do I do? I'll be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, God, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. Though my body be destroyed, I will see God. Or like Job, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know what you're doing in this set of circumstances. But Father, no matter what happens to me, you are still good. And I'm going to trust you. My emotions are screaming at me. My circumstances are screaming at me. Everyone's saying God's abandoned me. But Lord, I know you're, you are true. And you thank you, God. I don't know what's going to happen, but I thank you. The best days are ahead for me in Christ Jesus. I may not see it on this side of heaven. You cannot evaluate your life by this life alone. It's incomplete. We are eternal beings. You may not get what you hope for this side of heaven. You might not only see it on the other side like Abraham did. Isaac and Jacob, they didn't see the promises of God, but now they saw the city far off. So we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. But you may not see, he takes amazing, amazing trust. So it's by thanksgiving. I want to conclude with a story of an illustration of a man who had a trip to heaven and a trip to hell. This is a Parable, not a real story. Just to make that clear. But this man went to, all of a sudden he opened a door and he went to this place and he heard this people crying. And he heard screaming. It was a horrible sound. But, but besides that, it was a blue sky, a sunny day. The birds were singing. He smelled delicious food like you would never believe, kind of like the men's barbecue with the smoked meats. Can I hear an Amen. He smelled barbecue. No, he smelled beautiful smelling food. He's like, wow, but why is everyone screaming? He sees this table in the distance. As he gets closer, these people, they're, they're skeletons that refuse to die. They have a sunken flesh in them, and they're screaming in the morning, and they're trying to feed themselves, but they can't because they have these long chopstick arms, and they cannot get the food in their mouth. It's a horrifying picture. The next second, he goes to another place. Exact same set of circumstances. The birds are singing, but this time he smells the food and he hears joy, laughter. There's like a party going on. What's going on? He sees the same table. He gets closer. This is what he sees. Chopsticks, but they're feeding each other and not themselves. They're feeding each other and not themselves. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. You and I are not made to be consumers. We're called to be producers. We're not called to be givers and takers. We're called to be givers and receiving with thanksgiving. My friends, you want to have a better life? This will help you this side of heaven and the next one. This will alleviate so much nonsense. Now, we're coming to the holidays. Can I hear it? Oh, no. You might be sitting with people you would normally not want to sit with. Stop worrying about what they think about you. 
but my mother's been mean to me, my father, this, and that, and my brother, blah, 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 blah. believe me, I've been there, I know that. Listen, I, I, I wish I could say I was, I was exempt from this, I'm not. How about when you go to the table, Lord, how can I bless my sister-in-law who drives me absolutely <laughs> crazy? <laughs> Lord, what's in me that's causing me to feel crazy? It's not my fault. It's not her fault, it's my fault. Search me, God. Know me. Know my anxious thoughts, right? How about you and I start being a blessing to somebody else? Freely you have received. Jesus says, now freely give. Can we do that in Jesus' name? Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you that your ways are higher, they're greater. Lord, every time you tell us to do something, it's for our own good. But for some reason, Lord, we're stubborn and we want to be hoarders. Lord, I'm guilty of it. And I suspect that many of my brothers and sisters here today and those who perhaps haven't even given their life to Christ yet, we struggle so much because we're trying to give, trying to get and take. But Lord, you have not called us to be takers. You've called us to be givers and receivers. Lord, I pray that you would just begin to heal marriages, Lord. That instead of a spouse saying, when he does that, then I will. No, I'll take the first step like you did, Jesus. Father, break off of us this taker mentality. Lord, let us be givers and receivers in Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every close, eye closed, let me ask you a question. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? You can't earn it. But what he requires from you are two things. Number one, you must believe he's the Son of God and that he rose again from the dead. And then you must be willing to surrender your life. Say, Father, I give you my life. I'm not perfect, but I give you my surrender. And if you're willing to give your life to Christ for the first time or surrender, maybe you used to walk with God, you're not walking anymore, and you want to get right, I want to give you an opportunity to, if you want me to include you in this prayer, I, I would like you to, in a, in a count of three, to raise your hand. Why? Because I want to come in agreement with you. So on a count of three, if you've never given your life to Jesus, or you've fallen away and you want to get right, on a count of three, I'm going to ask you to be a real man, a real woman. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand and keep it up until I, my, I lock with you. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you. God sees it. Thank you. Thank you. And one line. Okay, let's pray this prayer from our heart. It's our heart connected. Lord Jesus, that's right, Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to follow you all the days of my life. Come in my life now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.